It is now my very distinct pleasure to bring to the stage Nano Whitman. Now, Nano Whitman is the general manager of this here pizza shop you're sitting in the center of, and without whom this here pizza shop wouldn't be what it is. But Nano Whitman is much more than a guy who makes being a place to being at work lovely. Nano Whitman is a nice guy from Philadelphia who had the honor of backing up Luciano Pavarotti and saying behind him. Yeah, for real. Nano Whitman is having his album release, his CD release party, two days from now over in the Continental Club on Thursday night, Bastille Day. The release of his CD will be occurring. It is no surprise that Nano can tell stories because he's a singer-songwriter and that's what those guys do. But tonight, he's going to be an extra kind of special, kind of brave. Because what he's going to do is he's going to get up here without the benefit of a piano or guitar or eyeliner, which are his three main staple weapons <clears throat> in his arsenal of awesome. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please put your hands together for my very, very good friend, Nano Whitman. All right. So, uh, thank you, Phil. Thank you. Um, I'm from Philly. When uh, we graduated college, 02. This, this story takes place around 04, two years after I graduated, I moved. I was back in Philadelphia for about a month before I moved to uh, Texas. This is right before I came to Austin. In fact, the week I was moving to Austin. I was, um, I was uh, home for a month trying to prove to my parents, well, trying to make a little money. I was selling, my, my dad was moving back in with my mom. That's a, a different story. I was um, <laughs> selling everything in the house that, on Craigslist, and I was sh trying to show how savvy I was. As a young adult, I was trying to... Uh, be the mature, responsible guy who was moving off to Texas to follow his dreams, and this was okay, and everything was going to be fine, and I was in control. Um, I was uh, driving to New York with a bookcase in the back of the Suburban. This is the family Suburban, a storied car. Um, I uh, drove the bookcase up to my friend in New York, um, and every time I used to take the car up to New York, my dad would say, Dano, don't take the car to New York. <laughs> You're gonna get it stolen. It's gonna to get towed. Don't take it. I'd say, Dad, come on, that's fine. It's gonna be right. So this time I'm driving it up to New York, and I parked it, and I hung out with my friends, and I was. Um, it was one of those nights in New York. I was partying. For those of you who know what that means, uh, in this room, it was a pretty intense night. Um, <clears throat> woke up the next morning at 7:45 to move the car from one side of the street to the other side of the street. Something that happened in New York a lot whenever I would take the car. I was not going to spend the $45 to put it into the you know the lot or whatever. And so I woke up to move the car. I drove around for three hours looking for a spot. I, I remember looking at the car clock, 11 a.m., and I had definitely moved it by 8, and uh, had still not found a spot. I was, I was a little delirious by this point. I was a little hungover. I was a little hungover, really hungover. So I, I, I found a spot-ish. I found a spot. I found a spot. I pulled the car up. It's a big car. Spots are not as plentiful for Suburbans as for um, yeah. Neons or whatever else. And so I found a, what I, I deemed to be a spot. And I was delirious and I walked away from the car and I went back to my home, my friend's house. And I was a couple blocks away from the car when I realized, oh shit, I better figure out where to put the car. And I looked up, oh, third and Varick, okay, I'm like two blocks away. But that, well, that's fine, great, I'm, I'll find the car. Hung out for another couple days and uh, <laughs> went back to the car. Um, Bookcase was the last thing I was doing. <clears throat> Look for the car, walk around for the car. I had nothing else to do that day, honestly, but drop this bookcase off of my friends, go back to Philadelphia. Couldn't find the car. I found where I put the car. The car wasn't there. I, I think I found where I put the car. <laughs> and the car wasn't there. And so I figured, okay, it wasn't really a spot. So I spent that day um, riding around golf carts. In, believe it or not, in Manhattan, there are these huge uh, sort of warehouses where they keep the cars that have been towed. 
Um, I went to two of them in various places in Manhattan, drove around in golf carts looking for the Suburban, nowhere to be found. Then I reported it stolen. At this point, I had to call my parents and say, ah, oh, the car was stolen, um, I need the VIN number, etc." My mom tells me that, I reported it to the cops. I spent 30 minutes driving around the area with a cop looking for the car, because apparently people forget where they put their cars, and the cops are willing to drive around for 30 minutes and help you find the car. <clears throat> and then I went back to Philadelphia. So I would like to tell you that this is a story about losing my suburban, my family's suburban, but really this is a story about losing my dignity, <laughs> um, or some, I, it's a little, it's a, I can't, still can't figure out exactly what I lost, but I know I lost a lot and I'm still looking for it. It, it has to do with a, a sort of a conception of respect that I thought my parents had for me at that time. <laughs> and that I was trying to prove, um, you know, I, I graduated from Harvard. This was, I was like, I was, I was you know, a promising young man um, <clears throat> who couldn't hold on to the suburban. Um, among many other things that I did while I was in college. I was trying to sort of outlive some of those stories. The next morning, um, I was sleeping on the third floor of my, where my dad was living on an air mattress. There was nothing in the room, like a little this end up desk and a rolly chair from my childhood and my air mattress on the floor. And the next morning at 4.30 a.m., the phone rings. Um, the phone rings, and now my dad's a heart surgeon. It's not that abnormal for the phone to ring at 4.30 in the morning, but after, about a minute after the phone rang, I hear his steps coming up toward, not down oh, to the hospital, but up to me, the only thing on the third floor. And my dad sits down, and my little brother insists that I tell this part of the story. Um, my dad sat down in his tidy whities My dad, uh, you don't want, you don't want my dad to sit down and come find you in the middle of the night in his tidy whities. <laughs> um, he's a hairy dude. <laughs> Take after him. He, uh, he has had the same tidy whities since 1977. <laughs> and there's no elastic, really, around here. So there's always a risk that you're going to catch a glimpse of something that you just don't need to see. <laughs> Especially when you're in trouble, which is also part of my dad coming to find you in his tidy whities. It's happened to me a lot in my life. And he sits down in front of me and he says, <clears throat> Nano? And I sort of, yeah, peering up, you know, I'm away, peering up. That was the New York City police. <laughs> yeah. They found the suburban. Where was it? About a block and a half from where you said it was. <laughs> It has two parking tickets on it, <laughs> and they said that if you're here within the next two, if you're there within the next two hours, they won't tow it. At which point, my mind starts like, okay, the train, and I can get up there, and he sort of interrupts me, get dressed, we're going to get the car. Okay. <laughs> and then he gets up in his tidy whiteies, and he's off. <clears throat> I got dressed. That hour and fifteen. In the middle of the night, it takes about an hour and 15 minutes to get from Philly to New York. That hour and 15 minutes in the car was the longest hour and 15 minutes I've ever spent in the car. I was mortified. No, gone was this conception of me as a young, promising Harvard graduate who was moving to Texas to follow his dreams. No, no. Now I was the kid who lost the Suburban because he left it a block, couldn't find it, parked it in New York, couldn't figure out where it was. I was mortified. Drop me off. I picked up the car and drove home. And at that point, I promised myself, okay, I am going to, I've got two days in Philadelphia before I leave. I am, this is going to be, my dad is going to forget about this by the time I'm on that plane. This is going to be gone. I am going to sell every single thing in this house that he doesn't want. And I am going to be just so, uh, the most upstanding young man that he's ever beheld. <laughs> So that day, I was delivering a three-compartment sink to West Philadelphia. You may um, 
remember West Philadelphia from the uh, song in West Philadelphia, <laughs> born and raised, all the playgrounds where I spent most of my days. Got one little fight, my mom got scared. West Philadelphia is not a good neighborhood. Um, it's not the worst neighborhood in Philadelphia, but it is not a good neighborhood. And um, it's a little scary for you know a young middle class white boy in his big black suburban driving down the street. So I'm on 51st and Walnut, and I'm driving down the street, and it's one of these like really busy streets, bodegas, everybody's out, and it's really hard to imagine this in Austin, but there really isn't a white person to be seen anywhere, and there are people everywhere. It doesn't happen here, it happens in Philadelphia. So I'm, I'm driving down the street, and um, I'm at the light, and I'm, I'm you know putting everything behind me, and the light turns green, and I start to go, and a cop pulls right out in front of the car, and just jams on the brakes right in front of my car, and I'm like, that's crazy. This cop's driving like a madman. I don't know to this cop. At which point, both doors open, cops peel out of both sides, turn around, pull guns on me, both of them. Next thing I know, they've come, they've ripped me out of the car, they push me up against the suburban, I'm handcuffed, and throw me in the back of the car. And I am the uh, I am in, in the middle ring of the circus, in the middle of a really busy intersection, in the middle of all these bodegas and McDonald's and everybody and their grandmother watching what's going on. My dogs who are in the car, my family dog, my dog's like a 13 pound sort of Yorkie guy. My family dog, John Elway, is, uh, is a half Rottweiler, half German Shepherd, and he's going nuts. And uh, I'm in the back of a cop car. And um, I know what's happened. I know what happened. You know, there's like a low jack system on the Suburban. They know where it is. Um, and uh, I'm being arrested for stealing my family's car. But I just had guns pulled on me. I've never seen a gun. I mean, I saw a shotgun, you know, every once in a while. I've never, definitely never seen handguns up close. I've definitely never had a gun pointed at me. And I've definitely never been pushed up against my suburban and been handcuffed and thrown in the back of a cop car. It took a very long time for me to convince the cops, oh, this is when they come up to me and they're like, all my papers are in the car. And they come up to me and they're like, whose car is this? What's going on? And they're yelling at me and I'm shaking, trying to sort of um, put reality and what's happened and my emotional state in, in the same place. <laughs> and uh, they said, we're going to kill your dogs. <laughs> so I swear to God. Now, in retrospect, I don't know if they were serious, but I felt that they were serious. They were very serious about a lot of things at that moment. And I uh, said, no, no, please, please don't kill the dogs. Please don't kill the dogs. Oh, I'm thinking about my mom. This is not going to go well. <laughs> and I could totally pick that okay, So finally, they let me in. And um, I think they, they kept me in the car and actually drove my Suburban to the to ride. Maybe they let me drive and took me to the, to the police station, at which point they call my dad. <laughs> to verify that this is, I'm his son, and this is his car, and everything's okay, and I didn't steal it. And he's in the operating room. And the message gets to him while he's operating, presumably, that he needs to call the police uh, station for his son. He's, and they held me, and then an hour later, my dad verifies that I'm his son, and they let me go, and so forth and so on. So much for putting that forgetting suburban in New York behind me. I am once again mortified and just counting the minutes to get to Texas. Golly. So um, later that night, 1.30 a.m., I'm sleeping on my air mattress, and uh, the doorbell rings. And I'm thinking, oh my god. What friend of mine is ringing the doorbell at 1.30? Certainly this is not for my dad. And we're the only two people in the house. Who's ringing the doorbell? Cannot possibly be. And so. I hear the steps, my dad going down to the to the front door, and I'm like, I better go down there because it's probably some jerk-off friend who's totally drunk and like wants to come and hang out before I leave for Texas. And it's the cops. <laughs> and they're wondering about the stolen car that's parked out in front of the building where <laughs> it's registered. So they forgot to take it out of the LoJack system. My dad in his tidy white is talking to the cops. <laughs> And then, you know, he sort of says, it's okay, now I don't know, I'm going to get back to bed. And I'm, you know, <laughs> upset. And then later that day, uh, the next day, driving down Lincoln Drive, it's sort of curvy, busy road, pulled over, handcuffed. <laughs> <laughs> that time, they, no dogs, no threat, threatening to kill them. And, but I did get a text message from a friend, is that you handcuffed? <laughs> <laughs> I'm on Lincoln Drive. 